expect to have uh, as many people that since we converted okay. this into uh, to a virtual open day, but it's a, it's a good thing to, to have you. Just want to just check a few things with, with the team. Can we get? Do I need to speak into a mic or is it okay to speak like that? Yes. Yeah, please. Okay, sorry. Right. Okay. And uh, if I ask questions to the people online, will you be able to indicate if they're. So if I have a question while I'm asked, if I start with a question, so I didn't put that in the pigeonhole, can they type that or uh, we won't be able to get it? Okay, so I'll, I'll look at you to see that. How do I change the slides? Um. Thank you very much and uh, welcome to Haryatwati University in Malaysia. It's great to uh, see all of you here. Uh, great to have the interest in, in our programs, specifically in, 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 the, in the talk. But I, I just wanted to start by asking a question. Why are you here? What, what would you like to achieve uh, from this talk? Can someone answer me? Maybe one or two answers, parents or students? Equally welcomed. I'm sure you have other things to do. So you are here to sit for an hour talking to me. I'm sure there is something that you would like to achieve. Yes. So you are motivating your son. Where's your son? Right. Okay. So why are you here? Don't know. Okay, who, who does not really know why they are here? It's actually, it's quite all right to not know. Can you raise your hands? Okay, raise your hand, raise your hand. I think you are a very brave person. You don't know why you are here. Your father asked you to come, put a mask and be here, right? Yes. How about the rest? We have a very brave soul here. Two, two, yes, three, three. Okay, yes, three who don't know what they are, why they are here. Yeah, who else? Who doesn't know why they are here? It's good. Right, so you want to know more about the prospects of engineering. Okay, okay, great. Um, anyone else? Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah, so again, a father motivating the daughter. So, so why, why are you here? Let me start with you, sir. Right, so you want... You can make a choice. Right. Good. Actually, this, what I've picked is the notion of choice. Why I've picked the idea of motivation so that we take uh, action. Uh, also, I have picked the notion of a bit of uncertainty. I don't really know, you know, things are changing and... Yeah, so we just want to know, we just want to hopefully learn something new and hopefully by the end of the day we'll be a little bit more motivated, a little bit more clearer about our choices. So thank you very much for, for, that, for that engagement, it really means a lot to me. I am going to uh, start with another question, this is part of my, 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 my talk, but it actually... It needs to start with a story. So the story happened during World War II. Um, the war between the Allied forces and mainly Germany. And the uh, Allied forces will send airplanes to bomb Germany. They go actually by almost the thousands in each raid. They go and bomb all the infrastructure, the cities, the military. Uh, 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 installations and so on. But they noticed something, as you could imagine, not all the airplanes would come back, right? So some of them will be shot down. So they noticed that, okay, people go, not all of them come back, and this is very good for the Germans, but very sad for the, for the British and their, and their allies. So they, they noticed a, a strange pattern on the airplanes that came back. And the pattern was, if they took, if they look at all the airplanes that they came back, 
and they looked at the bullet holes into the body of the airplane, they notice a curious uh, pattern. And the pattern is, usually the front section of the plane has around five bullet holes on average. Not everyone will have five. Some will have six or seven, some will have three or four, but if you take all the airplanes that came back and you average them out, the average is around five. The B section or the wing section, again, it's around four. Section C is around one. So sometimes they have two, sometimes they have none, but on average, they will have one. So it's actually the least number of bullet holes. And section D, which is the tail, will have three. Is it clear? Now, if you are on the side of the Allied forces, you would love to increase the survivability of your airplanes, and you would like to strengthen the body of the airplane so that the anti-aircraft uh, machine gun that comes from the German side would not penetrate your airplane. And the easy way to do this, or the right way to do this, is through adding armor, some thick metal to cover the airplane. Now, the issue here is the more armor you add, the heavier the airplane, and that will lead to make the airplane very difficult to maneuver, and it reduces its payload. Because if you put more armor, you can put less <coughs> fuel, and you can put less uh, 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 bombs in it. So the guys who were in charge of the military said, why don't we speak to some engineers or scientists or mathematicians and ask them if we had only, if we can only strengthen one section, if there's only one section that we can strengthen, what would the section be? based on the data that you see. So I'm going to ask everyone in the room to think of this question. Parents and children alike, which part, if you have only enough material to strengthen only one of these sections, which section would you strengthen based on the data? Think first, think first, think first. I know you are eager to answer. Think, and you have in your mind, maybe without talking to the person next to you, which one you think you will strengthen. Is it A or B or C or D? Think first. Do I have a marker pen, Camelia? Do I have a marker pen? Okay, you have, you have, you have an answer in your head? So you don't have, you, you, this has happened, so, you, so I don't want you to Google it. Yeah, I want you to think. Yeah. Okay, so let's assume you have an answer already. Okay, those who think we should strengthen uh, section A, please raise your hand. Okay, leave your hand because I want to count. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 13, 14, 15, 16. So we have 16. Can someone try to remember the numbers? Because I don't have a marker pen, interestingly. Yeah. So A is 16. Who thinks that we should strengthen section B? Oh, okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. No hands here? Okay. So... 10 for section B. Who thinks that we should strengthen section C? C, okay. One, two, three, four. C, four. Okay, D? I, I thought you raised your hand just now? No, okay, D is one, so only one for D. Good. So I have some news to you. I think potentially it could be good news. I've asked this question actually around the world for different groups of people. And I am pleased to say that this group was the group with the most incorrect answers. 
So, so, so you are a very special group. Very, very special group. So that's, 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 that's good, I think, somehow. Now, uh, who said the answer is C? Because the answer is C. Okay, now, can you explain to me why you think the answer is C, young lady here? Because sometimes, actually, people do get the right answer for the wrong thinking. You, sometimes you, know, you think wrongly. Seriously, it happens, it happens. You pick something correctly. Yes. So why, why did you... Okay, why don't you just come here? Yeah, I think, I think she's a bit shy. Can we give her a hand? Yes, please. This is being streamed around the world, so make sure that you... Yeah. Look at the camera and explain to us why it's C, the least, the one with the least bullets. I think, I think we should strengthen the strength. Like, we should strengthen the strength. Yeah. Any more? Just, like, um, like, let's say adding armors, it'll make the, the airplane more heavier, right? Yes, that's right. So I think that, that part, it's easier. Like, it's just, just one bullet. Yes. Every, on average, one bullet. Yes. So... I think when it there, it won't make the airplane that heavy, and we can just protect that part. It's easier to protect that part compared to the others. Let's see. Give her, give her a big hand again. Yes. Okay. Anyone who said C has a different answer. Okay. Judging when you said that the Allied bombers actually bombed Germany, so perhaps it's a bomber. And then for a bomber, the fuel will probably be put in C. And then if the case is were, is to actually save the pilot's life, I think it's better to strengthen the fuel storage as compared to A, because if the probability of a bullet hitting A, it probably not explode, but if it hits C, it will explode. And then therefore, it's probably better to strengthen that part. Uh, because if it hits that part, it's less likely for the bombers to survive. That's perhaps why most of the planes will not hit in that part in the first place. So, so this, is, this is closer to the right answer, but it's still not the right answer. But, but it's closer. Now, let me tell you the right answer. And actually, this is something, if you don't get it, it's all right. Because many people, after my talk, say, can you tell me why it's for section C? OK, now, imagine the airplane is going to Germany, and the Germans are trying to shoot them down. The Germans are not aiming at a specific section of the airplane. They are just filling the sky with bullets. So the likelihood of each section to get hit is absolutely equal. Now, where is the airplane that had Four, oh, what did I do? The one that had four or five or six bullet holes in section C, where is it? Every section had the potential to be hit as many bullets as section A. What do you think happened to the airplane that had more bullet holes in section C? It is, it did not come back. It was shut down. It was shut down, exactly. So what does that mean? It means this area somehow is either the weakest area or it has some important tables or controls for the airplane that when it gets hit more here, it will actually fall in the enemy territory and does not come back. Because we did not study the planes that fell. We didn't have the wreckage of that planes. We studied the planes that came back. And who, who, who didn't get it yet? Okay. We, we, we can talk more about it. So the idea is through implying engineering and scientific thinking, the Allied were able to actually optimize the 
situation and create a solution that improved the survivability of their airplanes. Now, this is one of my favorite examples when I talk about science and engineering. Because the life we live in today is full of uncertainty. The life in which we live today has issues such as incomplete information, misleading information, information that we don't know how to make decisions about. And engineers and scientists are people who will use all that uncertainty and convert it into an opportunity. So these are the skills that we build into our scientists, into our engineers. We drill them into their heads, the challenges that they will face day in, day out, would require them to answer questions are similar to this. So the talk, uh, the, um, the talk title was really motivated by when I looked at the number of the CEOs who are leading very large and very successful companies. And it's around 30% or so of them had first degrees as engineers. And that includes McDonald's, include Amazon, so Jeff Bezos is an engineer, and, and many other uh, uh, companies as well. And we ask ourselves a question, why this profession specifically contributes that big number of, uh, or a big percentage of the number of CEOs who are leading successful companies? So I ask myself a question, what do CEOs do? And I think a, a CEO is a person who needs a vision. A vision is a dream, but it's about really looking at whatever is available out there and having and converting and transforming uncertainty into opportunity for their organization or their firm or their companies. So being able to have a dream that converts the uncertainty into an opportunity, into value, creating value. But the dream is not enough. You need to develop a strategy. And the strategy is if you are making a product or you are creating a service or creating whatever you are creating as a, as a, as a leader of your organization, you will need to come up with a strategy on how are you going to put the engineering bid, the accounting bid, the HR bid, the marketing bid, the promotion bid, all of that, put it together so that you know how can you achieve that dream in the time frame and within the restrictions and the challenges that, are, that you face within your environment. Then after you have the strategy, it's still not sufficient. You have to implement the strategy. So you start doing the things that you said you will be doing in your, in your strategy. You need to make decisions. Do you close the campus or do you not close the campus? Do you cancel the talk or do you keep it open and see if people want to come? What, how, how do you, these are all decisions that we have to make on a daily basis and all of them are difficult. No, there's no easy decision because if it's easy decision, a machine would have done it. And most importantly, after you, while you are implementing your strategy, you need to build teams that will go with you, teams who will believe in your dreams, teams who will be well compensated, well communicated to, so that they are willing to, to, to follow you. So all of that complexity that any person who is leading an organization will do requires critical thinking, requires creativity requires the ability to communicate well, requires that positive thinking in which you decide, while this may sound like difficult times, I think there's an opportunity within it and we are going to work on, on unlocking the value that this difficult time brings. So to me, this is what generally uh, CEOs uh, do. Now, if I look at what, what do engineers do? Engineers conceive, think, dream products and services that did not exist 
yet. So they conceive, which is very similar to the dream bit, the vision that a CEO has. Then they have to design. Designing would happen when they start. So the dream may be I will make the best car or the best phone or the best website or the best um, scanning machine. You need to design it and decide how big will it be, what material you'll be using, how are you going to power it, what color will it be, and so on and so forth. So you conceive, you have a dream, then you design, you have a plan, you put it on paper. After that, you need to build it. So you need to implement it. So conceive, design, then implement. And finally, you need to make sure that this system or device that you have built is able to operate repeatedly, safely, and consistently. So you think of anything that human being made, and whether it's an airplane or a sewing machine or, or, or the easiest or the simplest of devices. Let's, let's pick an airplane. Someone needs to come up with the idea. Even, even if we have, if we know how to make airplanes, someone needs to say, I'm going to make an A380, which would be that big and will be able to, to do this and um, will be that fuel efficient and so on and so forth. Then they need to make the design. How big will that design be? How big will, will, the, will the wings be? What kind of materials will be using? Are we going to use uh, carbon fiber or, uh, or, or aluminum or whatever material we are going to use? After you decide the design, you need to build it. You need to implement it. And then this machine has to, be, has to fly again and again and again and again and again. And we expect it to remain well-maintained and, and, and remain uh, airborne uh, and safe. And that's what engineers do. And to do that, they will require, guess what? Innovation, critical thinking, and the, that positive thinking that believes that new things can be done. New technology can be done to help the humanity and to do uh, something great with it. So engineers are, while they are now people who go to universities and get degrees that say that they are engineers, but they have always been among us people who have challenged the limits, people have, who have dreamt big, and people who have dreamt of shaping the world using whatever material and technology available to do something different. So if you look at the, um, the pyramids, or the aqueducts in, in, in the Roman time, uh, all of these were inventions that were uh, invented and built by engineers. And if you think about it, even the pyramid, someone has to think first that we can build a pyramid and then has to decide how high will the pyramid be and how big will it be, so I have to design it, has to implement it and, and bring the workers and the and the rocks and everything to put it together and, and finally, you know, use it to whatever it was used as tombs or as places of, of, of worship. Now, if you look at engineers and their role in our modern society, air travel, communication, medication, all of that is done by engineers. So let me, let me pick the example of medication because this is something that is um, often, seen as, uh, often seen as something that is led by, by pharmacists, and that's potentially true. Now, if you think of the Panadol pill, the Panadol pill has an active ingredient and mainly other material that support it and put it together. And the design of the pill will be done by a medical professional or a pharmacist. Now, let's say we've decided that this is the right combination. The people who will make sure that the billions of pills that are made around the world every year have exactly or almost exactly the same active materials are engineers. Engineers are the people who will take all these ingredients in the tons and mix them, yet you are confident 
that if you take one Panadol pill, it will have exactly the right dose of active material. They are the people who will ensure that the machinery to make the pharmaceutical that we are using is in good shape and able to produce repeatedly, consistently the same quality. And this would be the same if you talk about the shampoo that you've used or the lipstick that you've used. All of it has engineer, engineering embedded in it, whether it's mechanical or chemical or electrical. Now, engineers now continue to be the key for the biggest challenges that we are facing as a humanity uh, nowadays. So whether it's the challenge of the environment or the challenge of drinking water or the challenge of uh, the energy, all of these are challenges that we would require technology to resolve. These are very difficult challenges. They are very similar to the question that I asked you in the beginning. The data is not complete. The picture seems to be pointing in a, in a direction of A or B, but it actually it's C. All of these are, are natures of the world that we are living in. So that's really the situation. That's really the condition. That's really the environment in which we are operating. This is the environment in which we are choosing whether should I do engineering or actuarial science? Should I do, should I even study at all? You know, there are, I, my, my own son, he said, do you really think I should go to the university? This, and it's a legitimate question, if you, if you think about it. It's scary, but it's a legitimate question nonetheless. So it's a, it's a very different world, full of uncertainty, and requires what I've talked about, these skills, specific skills that we are teaching our students and building into our students to, to, to you know, to answer it. So if you ask me, what would be the skills that a successful engineer, successful CEO, a successful graduate, a successful human being in general, a successful young person in general will need to have? I think they will be in these six domains. The first domain to us is about global citizenship. It's about leadership and it's about impact. The second one is about being emotionally intelligent and it's about being happy. It's about being able to have the good life. It's about having people skills, but it's also about entrepreneurship, innovation, and creativity. And it's also about critical thinking and decision making, which is very important. And it's about putting all that together and being able to create value so that you are employable, so that you can get a, a job, which is, I think, is a very important thing. Now, the way we do this, not only for our engineering students, but for all of our students, is through a program that we call the Empower Program. And the Empower Program is a program that every undergraduate student at Harriet Watt University, Malaysia, will, will, will go through. So the program goes in four stages. The first stage is about knowing and leading self. We actually spend the entire first year focusing on knowing and leading self. So for example, in the area of global citizenship, leadership, and impact, we ask our students, what impact do you want to have on the world? Now, if you go to any university, I think in the world, and you ask the students, what do you do? I think the students will tell you, I'm doing chemical engineering, I'm doing accounting, business, and finance, or I'm doing actuarial science. And that, they are all very legitimate answers. We draw a sense of identity from the things that we do and we study. But our dream is, if you go to our university and you speak to a student, and tell them, what do you do? A student will look you in the eye and say, before I graduate, I plan to plant a million trees because they will remove a million tons of CO2 from the atmosphere during their lifetime. And by the way, I'm doing chemical engineering. So we are putting the, trying to get our students to think of their impact, of their purpose first, and then of their degrees 
later. There's a reason for that. People who know why they are doing what they are doing will be able to stick with it when it's difficult. People who are clear of their purpose we will, will be happier, will be healthier, will be having all sorts of motivations to themselves and to the people around them. So defining the purpose is such an important thing. And we in Ateria Twa, every one of our students, as a matter of fact, and every one of our staff members had to work on developing their impact statement so that they know why they are doing what they are doing. Now, we, we do things with the other domains as well, and they are uh, very important. I think information has been provided uh, to you, but I wanted to go quickly to the next levels. So the first level, which is knowing a leading self, students, as they complete it, they don't gain marks. They get watt points, and, and they can gain up to 999 watts. And the idea is, you know, watt is the, is the unit of measuring power. So it's like you are having a light bulb that lits for yourself because you need to know yourself first before being able to help and lead others. The second level, which is the kilowatt level, is about leading teams. And the following level is the megawatt level, which is about leading communities. And finally, the gigawatt level, which is about leading enterprise. So for example, people who uh, who, who are the president of our student society. They are doing such an important work to themselves and also to the community of our students. They are operating at the gigawatt level. They are people who are leading communities. For leading enterprise, we are looking at people who will be able to, to create jobs before they graduate. So as you could imagine, not everyone will go to the gigawatt level, but we would like majority of, the first level is compulsory, everyone has to do it. The second two levels, we would like to encourage majority of our community to, and our students to go through. And finally, the gigawatt level is something that we would like uh, at least 10% of our students to, to attempt, which is to be a job creator rather than being a, a job seeker. So this is the Empower program that we believe it actually, it is actually helpful for engineers, for other graduates, but it's also helpful for CEOs and, and leaders. And interestingly, there are people from the industry who are asking us to adapt this program for their leadership teams, and we are doing, doing that. Now, there is another topic that I wanted to, to talk to you about. And it's the topic of jobs. Now, who is worried that when they are graduating or when their children will be graduating in three or four, some five years, the job that they are being trained for will be automated? A computer or a robot will be doing it better than them. Who is worried about that? Can you raise your hand if you are worried about that? You are no worried. Good. Please be worried. Please. So the, depending on the reports that you read, there are talks now about 800 million people could lose their jobs. Let me ask the parents, do you remember the travel agents? Do you remember that? Do you remember how did we used to book tickets? Do you remember that? We used to go to a shop, someone would look at the flights, and, and uh, uh, th there was a whole building in KL. Do you remember Angsaraya? Yeah, so that was a whole building full of travel agents. So you say, I want to go to Australia. You go to the first one and you check the price. You take the quotation, you go to another person. She's baffled. She said, did you do that? That's how we used to book. And then after that, you decide that it's going to be this. They will, they will go and they'll print you a ticket. And it has multiple. Do you remember that? Anyone remembers this? Show me your hand. I, I feel that, like the oldest person in the room. Yeah. Now this whole job has gone. 
If you want to book a ticket, what do you do? You go online, you go Expedia, it does all the check for you, finds the cheapest way, and then you are done. So this has been happening. And, and I think the talk before me by, by Dr. Fu was really about the, uh, the uh, accounting job being threatened by, by automation. Now, aspects of engineering are also threatened by automation. So the automation is here, it is coming, and it is taking jobs. It is removing jobs from the market. It's also creating jobs, but we don't know whether the jobs that they create, first, are they enough? Are they, do, do, when, they, when you remove 800 million jobs, do you create an 800 million jobs? That's number one. Number two, the jobs that they are creating, are they all well-paid jobs or not? So this is another question. Now, there are two schools of thoughts. One says jobs will be destroyed, new jobs will be created, the new jobs will be great, don't worry. The other school of thought says job will be gone, maybe few jobs will be created, please worry. Now, I will work with you a mental model on whether, and then you make up your mind whether you should worry or not. So I believe that we bring to any endeavor in our life that we do three types of labor, three, three types of capabilities. Our physical capabilities, our mental or cognitive capabilities, and our emotional uh, capabilities. These go in, a, you know, in, a, in a gradual kind of complexity. So for, for physical labor, it could be as simple as you give me a broom to, to sweep the, the floor. So this is very basic. Or it could be uh, I'm performing uh, a heart valve replacement surgery. It has a very, uh, you know, dexterity and manual bit is, skill is very important part of it. Cognitive labor is about thinking. So the simplest or the lowest level of our cognitive capability is our memory, our ability to remember things, but it goes up to analysis, critical thinking, and ultimately to create creativity. The, cognitive, the emotional labor is really about our capability, our ability to, to have a sense of purpose. It's about ability to have sense of passion, connect with people, and build teams, and communicate effectively, and it's about ethics and, 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 and things like that. Now, interestingly, we as human beings have been always not wanting to do the difficult jobs. So we have been creating technology and domesticating animals to, to replace us so that someone else or something else could do uh, our, our jobs. So the part that, that is shaded in, in, uh, in this uh, graph is the areas where, represent the areas where we have, a, we have been able to automate or replace ourselves at. And for the, for the longest time in our history, this has focused on the manual job. So we, we got the domestic, we domesticated the animals, we had the, um, uh, we've created the, or invented the wheel, all for, for us to be able to perform things that are a bit difficult for us uh, physically, and we got other things to do it on our uh, behalf. That carried on until the 1800s, where we had the first industrial revolution, where there was an explosion in the replacement of human beings in, at the manual labor level. So we had machines that were able to knit the cloth on our behalf, machines that are able to, to uh, pull uh, heavy trains. So many people, scores of them, lost their jobs. And that was the time where our university started. And the university started in Scotland at exactly that time where people lost their manual jobs and they wanted now to move into the cognitive domain. So people are now becoming a bit more like managers, maintaining these equipments and, and repairing them and selling them and, and all of that. So this all was the uh, cognitive bit. But interestingly, at the same time, we started to make some machines that exhibited some cognitive capability. So we've created 
primitive calculators, but all of the time, all the time we, we thought that human beings will always be superior because they are cognitively superior. They can think, the machines cannot think. 1997, the situation changed. When the reigning human champion of chess lost to a machine. And there was no going back since then. So currently, there is no human being that can beat a computer at chess. None. There's no human being that can beat computer at the game of goal. That's it. As a matter of fact, also, computers are now better at medical diagnosis and reading of x-rays than any living human doctor. So slowly but surely, the machines are becoming better than us in the cognitive uh, domain. And this continues to increase. How many of you use Waze to travel? I do that. So Waze accumulate all of this data and give us an advice. There is no human that can give. It will find ways that and, and roads that you've never thought about. So it is very, very uh, progressive and it keeps on getting better by, by the day. So this is expected to continue. And if you look at the skills that are left to the left, these are the skills that CEOs need. These are the skills that the engineers use. These are the skills that employers are telling us, please give us graduates who are able to think critically, who are creative, who are team players, who have a sense of purpose, who have a sense of ethics. Now, there's something about these skills. First of all, most of them are in the emotional domain, the domain that machines are incapable of doing. And that's great. It means the future jobs for humans will have a lot of that into them. But at the same time, these are the skills that are the most difficult to teach, the most difficult to learn, and the most difficult to assess. If I want to teach you that one plus one equals two, I could repeat it long enough, and then I could put you in a test and I say, what is one plus one? And you tell me two, and I, I know you've learned it. But all of us who have tried to, let's say, motivate another human being would know how difficult is that, and how difficult to tell whether that person is really motivated or, or not. So these are the things that I believe the future of jobs would require them increasingly. I think that while engineers and accountants and actuarial scientists and psychologists will need to learn the basics of their uh, profession, but having these skills will make or break us as, 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 a, as a species. Now, I just wanted to get you some uh, reference to some uh, reports that have been really talking about that. So this is a report that was released early Last, uh, late last year by Kazana Research Institute, and it talks about employers seeking soft skill, including strong work ethics, good communication, being creative, uh, having analytical thinking, able to solve challenges, team players, having a positive thinking. These are the things that employers are asking for. Andy Haldane is the chief economist of Bank of England. So he's an economist of the Bank of England, but he said students may be better off developing emotional intelligence rather than cognitive skills to prepare them for a future of work in which they will be competing against robots, because that is the reality. Now, while our emotional capability, the thing that only us can do, and machines cannot beat us at, is the last stand for humanity, we don't seem to be doing really great there. 
So this is a study by Professor William Damon from Stanford University that showed that youth generally are struggling with a lack of purpose. So when you ask people, what do you want to do? And they say, not sure. It's not because they are not good or they are lazy or anything wrong with them. It's something that is happening around it. There is so much choice. There is so much technology. There are so many things going on in the world that are actually confusing. And people, especially our youth, are struggling with having a sense of purpose. And that's why in the Empower program that I've told you about, in the first year, in the first semester, we spend most of the time within the program. They will still do all the technical bit, but there'll be a part where we keep on asking them, how do you want to make the world a better place? What is your contribution? What is the thing that you can do? Eventually, they need to come up with what we call an impact statement. And I'll show you examples of impact statements later. Now, another challenge that we are all facing is the issue with mental health. So increasingly around the world, that depression is becoming, is, is on the rise. Actually, suicide among youth is also a very, very worrying global trend. Suicide is the number one killer for male under 40 in the UK, for example. It's even ahead of the road accident. Overall, it's the second in the world after the road, road accident. So it is, so clearly uh, the, uh, the last domain, the last stand for humanity, our emotional capability and emotional potential is not really fully leveraged and something needs to be, needs to be done there. So what, what are our choices? What choices do we have here? I think we all need to pursue academic excellence. And that's why I think you are, despite the coronavirus, despite everything, you chose to come here. I think this is very important because you are looking for a university with the reputation, with the quality, with the assurance, so that you as young people and your parents, that you will have the a rock bed of academic excellence. But this would not be sufficient. I think we need to all develop emotional intelligence. We need to build emotional intelligence. This is a very important thing. And we also need to learn how our brain works because there's a lot of research that shows when we learn how the brain works, we will be able to to learn better, to motivate ourselves better, and to inspire and motivate others better. We need to learn how to be happy. Happiness is a choice. So life will throw things at us, things that we did not expect. And to learn to be happy is, I believe, is something that it's first a choice, and second, it, can, it should be part of the curriculum of, of the schools and universities. We also need to uh, know our purpose, why do we exist, and also we need to nurture and build a network of people who will be helping us achieve our, our, our goals. So how do we do all of that? So for emotional inte intelligence, for example, the first bit, we need to demystify what is emotional intelligence. And this is the bit that we teach again at the first part of the Empower program. Now, emotional intelligence, according to Daniel Goldman, and I totally agree with him, has four elements. The four elements are self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. As a matter of fact, you would, you would notice that knowing and leading self is all about self-awareness, of being aware of your own emotions, of your own stand, of your own weaknesses and strengths, and be able to you know, go with as much confidence into the world as you, as you could. So this is all being taught to, to our students in their, in their first year. One area to be emotionally intelligent and to be able to build better relationships is the area of gratitude. See, the brain has been wired to protect us. 
And because of this, it is very receptive to the negative stimuli. So if there's something negative, our brain will pick it immediately. The positive things just leaves it aside and doesn't really pay attention to it. And that is, this is something that was very good for, for us in, as we lived in the caves and in a very difficult and very challenging environment. But this needs now to change. We need to actually spend time to rewire our brain and make it more positive. And one way to make uh, that uh, move is to say thank you more for the people who have helped us. So I have a video of some of our students, they are actually our foundation students, um, thanking their, uh, their, their parents in the way that we have taught them in, in, our, in our program. So let me see if I can play that. I, I don't know how to react, okay? Hey, Ma. Hey, Dick. You always want to tell her, but very hard. <laughs> um, I'm about to read something to you, and um, here it goes. I love letter. Dear Mama and Papa, there are not enough words to describe how thankful I am to you. Thank you for carrying me and guiding me all the way. I feel incredibly grateful to have you as my mom. I bet you never expected this when I told you to attend my graduation. As your daughter, I can do so many things to make you be happy and be proud of me. I know I don't show how grateful I am enough, but I really am. As we are a typical Asian family and we rarely express our affection towards each other, From the time I couldn't speak properly at a young age and being a very shy little girl to being someone who is confident and very determined to achieve anything. I am grateful that you want me to have a better future. I'd like to tell you that you really mean a lot to me, even though I don't show it much. You're like my strength and pillar in life. Everything about you is amazing. First, thank you for never give up on our family or on me. Thank you for working so, so, so hard to be able to send me to university. And for that, I will never be able to repay you. Mommy, I like to say that you are my superwoman, my best friend and the best mom in the entire universe. You will still encourage me and tell me to never give up. I like to thank you for fully supporting me in whatever I do and letting me explore by my own instead of limiting my potential. Although I had made many mistakes, you will always forgive me. I am grateful for your kindness. Without you, there is no me and I would certainly not be reading this out loud to you right now. But because of your unconditional love and support, I was able to muster up all my courage to read this in front of you. From day one, you have been my support system. Thank you for thousands and thousands of dollars you, you and Dad spent on my education. So Ma, I just want to say thank you for always being my home therapist 24-7. I love you Mommy, forever and always. Love Ellie. You too. No, no. <laughs> So really the question is, whose life will you touch today? And I really mean it. So you all, you all make the decision to come here and listen to me and watch this. And this is a very emotional video for, for a reason. Because we, we planned it. We, we taught people how to say thank you in an effective way. So the... The method has three, four steps, actually. The first step is be specific for what are you thanking 
the person that you are thanking for. So thank you for sending me to university. Thank you for never stop believing on me. Thank you for forgiving me, even though I make a lot of, made a lot of mistakes. Number two, how did that thing help you? Because that believe in me made me do this. Number three, what did that person have to sacrifice so that they are able to provide you the thing that they are, you are thanking them for? And finally, acknowledge the character strength. I'm grateful for your kindness. I'm grateful for your teamwork. I'm grateful for your generosity. If you thank people like this, first of all, your brain is going to change. And the relationship is really never going to be the same. I want to have a request to everybody who is hearing me today that before the end of today, you go and thank someone in that way. It's, it, it could be difficult, but try it. So parents and children. So the parents themselves have parents to thank and have friends to thank and have teachers to thank. And it could be by a phone call or by a card or by even as simply as a WhatsApp method, WhatsApp message. So I, I, won't, I won't push you, but I really hope that you consider this because through this, you, you know, there is research that shows when we are happier and more grateful, even our immune system is better. And I think we need our immune system to be very strong now. I hope you agree with me on that. Now, the, the second video that I'm going to show you is an example of some of our students reading their, their impact, uh, impact statement, the, the, the part about them identifying their sense of purpose. I am endless potential. My purpose is to always challenge myself so that I am in a constant state of growth and self-development. My aim is to encourage the people around me to adopt a similar mindset. I'm a diamond polisher. I aim to build up the people around me, to help them achieve their full potential, to help them achieve financial independence, as well as build up a community of supportive individuals who continue building up others. I am a catalyst for change. I actively create bonds which foster agility, instill confidence and honest conversation. My energy creates a reaction which inspires and activates others to build and drive momentum. I am a change maker. My purpose is to use mathematical, financial and risk management skills to unlock the economic potential of the African continent and to best contribute to her development. And inside of me is a teacher who seeks to simplify complex ideas for the benefit of others. I am a work in progress. I am an engineer of change. My purpose is to design and build a promising future by transforming positive aspirations, ideas, hopes and imaginations into stunning realities. statement is, I am a storyteller, and my purpose is to inspire others to tell more empowering stories about themselves and about the world in which we all live. Everyone would be better off if we know why, why we existed. So this is very, very important work. I'm approaching the end of my talk, but this is something that I really wanted to share with you. As we do all this work, that we call positive education, that is focusing not only on the academic side of things, but also on building character, building purpose. We decided that we need a framework for all of us to see how can we be happy even when times are difficult. 
we thought, first of all, we need to redefine happiness because many people think of happiness as being bubbly and joyous all the time. It's not that. Happiness had, has 10 keys, and these are the 10 keys to a happier living. They go by the acronym Great Dream, and it starts by giving. When you give things to people, when you help people, you become happier. It's by giving, it's by relating, by exercising, by awareness, it's about trying out, doing something new. And it's also about having a sense of direction, it's about a sense of resilience, it's about fostering positive emotions, so that's the emotion bit, and it's about acceptance, it's about accepting who we are, and it's about having a bigger meaning in our life. So, at Harriet Watt University in Malaysia, we condition ourselves to think through the 10 keys of a happier living. So for example, when uh, one department or a group of students want to run um, a blood donation drive, we actually, when they fill the form, we ask them to think of what key of the happier living are they addressing in that event. And a blood donation drive could be about giving, but it also could be about trying out, because there are people who have never gave blood before, and maybe they want to try out something new, something that they did not do before. So it is very important for us to make the choice to be happy, to remain positive, because learning and innovation takes, uh, is, 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 being, is better being done there. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit more about employability, and this is just for those who are considering engineering. So the president of the Institution of Engineers, we said that we need 50,000 engineers to meet the challenges of the nation. Now, there are engineers who are unable to get jobs. And you know what? Because when they go to the job interview, they cannot communicate well, they are unable to show the uh, uh, employer that's in, uh, uh, interviewing them, they're able to work in teams, they're able to add value to them. So that's why it's important to realize that the, having the piece of paper that says you are an engineer is a very important start or first step, but it is never, never sufficient. And that's why I think we need to fill this gap of these 50,000 engineers, of engineers who are able to solve the kind of challenges that I shared with you earlier, while working with other people, while being able to communicate very clearly and very effectively as well. Um, how do I go back? Sorry, I, can I go back to the last slide? Okay, thank you. The title of the talk, because it's, it says from an engineer to CEO, an engineering degree can take you anywhere. So I thought it has a, something that is personal and I wanted to share something personal about myself. Um, two years ago, we gave uh, an honorary doctorate to uh, the Sultan of Selangor, the gentleman in the yellow gown. And he came here and he received the degree. And uh, the person in the middle is our Vice Chancellor, Professor Richard Williams. And you could tell maybe the person to, to your left is myself wearing my kilt. This is not a skirt, this is a Scottish kilt. So when, when this picture went on social media, a friend of mine texted me and said, when you were a child in Iraq 30, 40 years ago, have you ever dreamt of being in Malaysia, walking next to Malaysian royalty in a Scottish kilt? And to be very honest with you, I have never had that thought. When I was a child, I wanted to be an astronaut. That's what I wanted to be. And I never thought I'll be in Malaysia, but life will throw things at us. We will never know 
where it will take us. So that's why that question that he asked me reminded me of this picture. So this is Prince Edward who has visited our campus and I was walking next to him. So it's a very nice picture that I'm very, very proud of it. But because my friend asked me about my childhood and did I ever think that I'll be in Malaysia walking next to not only Malaysian but British royalty as well, as I told you, I didn't. But I thought of this picture. So this picture is of me with my father. And he is a man that I've learned a lot from. But in any way, I have been walking. And I have never stopped moving. And I think with the mindset of the positive mindset, the ability to share your passion, have a clear sense of purpose, I think success will be on our side. So with this, I would like to thank you very much. And I, will, I think we'll be taking uh, some questions uh, uh, now. Thank you. So, Camilla, do we take questions from the floor or we... So, if, if anyone has any question, we'll be very happy to, to answer that, but we'll see... Or are we doing it through the pigeon hole? Okay. So, we notice that sometimes people don't feel comfortable asking questions. And if we use technology, we use the technology... People are more open. So... You can take out your phones if you have that, but I'll, I'll still take face-to-face -face, uh, questions as well. So you need to scan this and then uh, start typing your questions if you have any. Yes? Yes. So the, the question is, what is the, the rate of, uh, of employability at our university? I, I, I could say 100%. So our students, depending on their courses, some, some, sometimes they actually get jobs before they graduate. So for example, our actuarial science students, they actually get jobs before they graduate. The, uh, Every one of our students who is seeking employability will get a job. Yes, yeah. There are some who chose to go for higher studies or to go and uh, see the world. But so far, we are every, I'm not aware of anyone who wanted a job and couldn't get a job. And it's all because of first, the kind of courses that we are running. So Harriet Watt University, Interestingly, if you look at the names, Harriet and Watt. So George Harriet is a, a, a famous Scottish financier, and James Watt is the person who started the, the, um, uh, the uh, first Industrial Revolution. And the university has always been at the intersection between technology and business. So the courses that we run, our courses are geared towards, uh, towards employability. And uh, we, uh, we prepare our students. So here in Malaysia, for example, we run mock interviews. We help them write their CVs. Uh, there is a lot of support that is geared towards um, employability. So those who, who are seeking jobs, they, so far, they are able to, to get their jobs. Thank you. Very good question. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Am I a CEO of an engineering firm? No, I'm a CEO of a university. So, so the university is not an engineering form, firm, but it is uh, a, a 70 million ringgit revenue a year firm. And we have 2,000 students and 210 staff that I'm uh, responsible for. Oh, so now we have the questions. Can you show them on the slides or you can't? Okay. So I have some questions that came here. Okay. The, 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 the one question said there are conflicting reports that engineers are in demand or there are surplus of them, which is true. 
Both. Both are true. So the 50,000 engineers that are needed are needed, and this country still gets foreign engineers. We still get people from outside Malaysia to do engineering work. And the reason is because there is a gap between the skills of the engineers that the system is able to produce and what the industry needs. So, as I said, there are engineers who are out there who are either not practicing, not by choice, or not even employed. And it's not because of anything, but because they don't have the skills that the industry is asking for. What are the skills that the industry is asking for? I've showed it to you. Teamwork, innovation, creativity. So if someone is the best person in solving partial differential equation and has great ideas about how to solve any industrial challenge, if they are unable to lead a meeting, take minutes, communicate, read financial statements, maybe they are not, not good. So both, both, uh, both uh, accounts are actually uh, true. But I, to me, if I look at the uh, recruitment uh, page in the newspaper or on job streets, I look at the number of jobs that are looking for engineers, and also when I look at the number of, uh, of engineers who are, um, you know, who come from overseas to work here, it tells me there is at least a, a, a mismatch. Our engineers also, they are not locally bound. So, and not only our engineers, actually our graduates generally, they are very mobile because they have a globally recognized degree and also the skills that we have been working with them on. So many, not many, but a, a good percentage of them choose to work in other places in other parts of the world for a variety of reasons, including better salaries and better exposure for other things. Have you, have you ever envisioned yourself as a CEO? Well, when I was a child, I envisioned myself as an astronaut. Uh, but I have always seen myself as an engineer. Because the engineer is not about only making goods and things and machines, but it's about engineering other people's experience. And I think engineers can do that well, or when they do that well, they can succeed in, in, in every uh, thing that they do. But uh, when this opportunity came to run a major uh, British university in Malaysia, I think it's very difficult to say no to that. So it's, it's, it's a great journey. One last question. Okay, what are the prominent links to industry with regards to Harriet Watt? I think, I think the question means how well connected are we to the, universe, to the industry? Uh, we are very well connected to the major players, to the multinationals. We have actually uh, looked at the companies that are uh, there in Scotland, in Dubai, and in Malaysia, because these are the three countries where we operate. And the list was really long, and these are the companies that we work, uh, uh, we work with, and uh, we work very closely with, not only for, from an employability point of view, but also from providing, working with them on some research uh, uh, initiatives and trying to solve some of the challenges uh, that they are, uh, they are facing. So Harriet Watt is an industry-anchored industry university, partly because of the uh, kind of programs that we are running. So I think the team is telling me that we run out of time, but I really would like to thank you for first being here, for choosing uh, to be in my talk specifically, and I hope you were not disappointed. Thank you very much. <laughs>